love it, Bob Dean with us. Because Bob Dean is really an inspiration to everyone. It's just that people are talking. Yeah, Bob like Dean, uh, whether you know it or not, uh, kind of dropped out of sight for a while and hasn't been doing too many conferences and not very much radio. And I talked with him recently and he confided to me that um, he hasn't felt much like talking uh, because he's been doing so much of it. And I felt the same way because I have been uh, kind of quiet myself since 9-11. I became very uh, disenchanted with the country I live in since 9-11. But seeing Robert Dean coming back into uh, the speaking circuit uh, was an inspiration to me. I was very inspired to see my dear friend Robert Dean decide to come back and begin to talk with us again because I believe what he has to say and just his appearance, just his person is enough to inspire many people. And so that's why I asked if I could um, have the pleasure of announcing it. My dear friend, Bob Robert Dean. I call him Bob. So, you'll be here at any moment. If you will take your seats. Robert Dean and I go back a long time. Back in um, Mesa, Arizona. Back in the very early 90s, uh, I met Bob Dean for the first time at a conference and he was speaking there and afterwards he was so gracious uh, to me and I was just a very... And we got the first, the first of three mics, let's do this one because it's easy. Yeah, that allows me to move a little bit. I was very impressed with Bob Dean, he invited me to go out to dinner with him. Now we're just going to put that in there to save the hassle of everything. I'm in the company of someone I know the market, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well. And, and then I'll go get the house line. And, uh, and be we'll friends here. here. It was very easy what to would be friend. comfortable for you? How about so the pocket down Put it in that pocket. Yeah, yeah. inspired by Bob Dean uh, over the years. And we just talked recently. All right, and sir. There we said, go. There we go. Happy. That he has decided to, to begin speaking mess with you again. Make it look unmessy. Sorry which has word. actually well, that, that'll do. Uh, Thank inspired you. me Thanks. to do the same. Sure. There's so much I would like to be able to say that I have been uh, quite literally afraid to say in public. The Bush regime frightened me, it scared me. And if you know what was really going on with the Bush regime, it would scare you too. It was a frightening presence on the American soil of the Bush regime. And the one we got now is not much better. <coughs> now, I had to rush up and get the transparencies. I had no idea you would come up with an overhead projection. Oh, didn't I tell you? Oh, God, you were something else. <laughs> you were something else. My apology. He is back now on the speaking circuit. Speaking as, as Bob and I do, Almost all speakers and, uh, and the speakers of these conferences will tell you. No, 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 I don't. Oh, I move around a little. Okay, yeah. she's, she's, she's got a conference. Somebody's going to flip your slide. There are many downsides to doing this. Well, yeah. And that's very... Um, I, I can do it. I'll, I'll put them up there. I just didn't... It costs you in relationships because you're on the road a lot. And um, it's not easy speaking before audience. But there are some upsides to being a speaker. There are some perks and nice things that you get from speaking. And one is that you meet some very interesting and fascinating people. And you become friends with some very lovely and decent people. And Bob Dean is one of the finest men I've ever met.
I want to be able to introduce Bob as not only my dear friend, but one who has not only impressed me, but inspired me, as I said to you before, now I'm saying it for his benefit, for him to hear, because he has come back into the speaking circuit and began to talk with us again, I think it would be a loss if he didn't. I have been inspired to come back into the speaking circuit and begin talking again. So, without further ado, the man I'm introducing, I love and admire, and a fascinating man, and I would suggest you listen closely because he's got a lot to talk about that he knows firsthand. Robert Bob D. The, the, the check is in the mail. Right? Okay. As long as it doesn't bounce, that's the It thing. won't bounce. <laughs> Thank you. Am I being picked up here? Is this carrying? I can move around a little bit. I was in the back of the room back there, and uh, I didn't realize that this scoundrel here, Bill Ryan, was going to come up with an overhead projector. <clears throat> so I had to rush up to my room and grab my transparencies. So I've got a few sh pictures to show to you that I think you might find interesting. I want to say it's an honor to be introduced by someone like Jordan. He's one of the foremost scholars of our time. And I honor and respect him. And as he said, we're old friends. We go back a long way. I also want to say a word or two about the young man who was up here on this podium before I showed up here. Rich Dolan is very special. He's probably the, one of the foremost historians of our time. And I strongly urge you, encourage you, to not only buy and read his first volume, but get the second. Because I'm waiting expectantly for volume three. That young man has pulled the cover back from this cover up in the scandal that we've been living through for the last 60, 70 years. <clears throat> and I take my hat off to him. I've known him for some time, and I, uh, I'm so encouraged by young men like him that are picking up and going with this program. Because as I'm sure all of you know, I'm a member of the old guard, and uh, we're diminishing daily, li literally. Not a week or a month goes by that I don't hear that some of my old cronies are gone. They're not gone, they've just crossed back. They're, in, they're home now. But uh, I miss them. And uh, I'm gratified to see some of the young men coming along that are filling the space for us. <clears throat> I'm also gratified to look out and see you guys. Because you're the reason I'm here. I don't speak publicly much anymore. I, I find it inconvenient. I, I hate like hell to travel in airplanes. I got back from Spain here at the end of July and I had to go to bed for a damn week. <laughs> and then I went through Kennedy Airport and I was outraged when I looked around at Kennedy. It, it, it's a national disgrace. I mean, it's dirty, the broken furniture, the service is rotten, the restrooms are filthy, and halfway, most of them are closed. It's terrible to walk through Kennedy, having gone through the airport at Barcelona and seen new and modern and, oh my God, those Spaniards are really something else. They put on a show there in Barcelona the last week in July that uh, was outstanding. 1,500 people showed up and they had standing room. It was a hell of a good con conference and I uh, was honored to be invited. I had Stephen Greer, uh, Stephen Bassett, who I will touch upon uh, briefly in a few minutes. And uh, 
I was gratified by the Spaniards, they're great hosts, and they're very enlightened and very interested in this subject. As many of you I'm sure know, this subject has been my favorite subject now for over the last 20 years. I've been on this journey for 45 years, but I've been speaking publicly the last 20. And I speak bluntly, openly, and I violate my national security oath every time I open my mouth. <laughs> and I plan to violate my national security oath tonight. <laughs> but again, a special thanks for you guys because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. I'm so encouraged by the people I meet at these conferences because not only are you open-minded, but you're enlightened and you're enthused because I think you've learned, as I have, that this subject is, in my opinion, the greatest story in human history because it is the story of human history. We're not alone, guys, and we have never been alone. We are members of an infinite universe filled with infinite intelligent life. And we have had an intimate interrelationship with several advanced extraterrestrial intelligences now for, oh, at least 10,000 years. And the evidence is pretty overwhelming that at least one, perhaps two of those different groups had a hand in engineering the human genome over a hundred thousand years ago. And that evidence is literally overwhelming. Now you, we're going to touch upon a whole bunch of stuff and I want you to understand, <clears throat> I have come to the point in my life where I have become to be almost sympathetic to the government for keeping the lid on this thing. <clears throat> they don't know how to lift the lid on this subject. They don't know how to lift the lid on Pandora's box because when they lift the lid just a little tiny bit, boom, the whole damn thing is going to come out and nobody in government is prepared for that. <clears throat> because the story is so damn big. I know that many of you, probably most of you, are aware of the famous Brookings Report. NASA gave a contract to the Brookings Institute in uh, the late 50s. And the basic point was simply this, try to find out what, what should we do if we in the future should encounter advanced extraterrestrial intelligence. And they worked on this thing, thank you, thank you my boy, thank you. They worked on this thing for three years published it in 61, delivered it to Congress in 61, and they concluded as a result of this study that if we should indeed at some point run into advanced extraterrestrial intelligence, it would probably be a good idea to keep your mouth shut and not tell the masses of people. Now Margaret Mead was on the, on the committee and she'd had experiences in the South Pacific with primitive societies, where they had been confronted by our advanced culture and those primitive societies shriveled and died. And the conclusion of the Brookings study was that if we indeed would encounter advanced extraterrestrial intelligence, we probably shouldn't tell the masses of people because, ooh, sociologically, theologically, scientifically, it would be a damn disaster. So they published that study and it literally became national policy. And it's one of the major reasons why the lid has been kept down so tightly on this thing for so long. <clears throat> As I said, it's not simply that we're being visited by guys from other planets. It isn't simply that we're being visited by guys from other star systems, nor are we being, you know, from other galaxies. 
Good God, those are all given. They also learned, and I knew that when I retired in 76, that we're being visited by guys from other dimensions. They're coming through portals, apparently. They create portals, apparently. And they're coming and going from other dimensions. And the more advanced societies we have encountered have been multidimensional. And it's no wonder that our ancestors deified these dudes back 10,000 years ago. I think there are people today who would deify them if they were to confront them and see what they can do and understand where they're from and what their capabilities are. You would think that it was almost godlike to have that kind of technology. So, over the years I have come to a point where I've almost began to be patient and tolerant of the government's lies. But not quite. Not quite. I'm so fed up with government lies, I don't even know where to start. You too, huh? <laughs> a couple of people, last week I was over at the Bay Area Conference, and a couple of people said, what have we learned in the last year since you were here? And I said, well, we learned that we American people elected a black president. Isn't that pretty damned impressive? Who would have ever thought that the American people could elect a black president? Listen guys, I'm from the last century. That, that is dynamite to me. And my heart goes out to that kid because I, I, uh, he's likable, he's personable, and he's bright. And uh, I wish him well. I hope to hell he can pull it off. He's got so damn much on his plate. But he ain't gonna disclose this subject anytime soon because he's not ready for this. I don't even think he's been briefed yet on what this is all about. You all know the story of what happened to Jimmy Carter who promised to everybody that when he was elected he was going to release all of the UFO information. He got into Washington and he got his national security briefing. He walked out of his briefing with tears in his eyes. Apparently, the director of central intelligence said, Mr. President, you don't have a high enough clearance, sir, to have access to all this material. Now, can you believe that? The director of central intelligence says, also, sir, you don't have a need to know. And poor old Jimmy just, he wilted. And as a result, he never said, who, about anything during his four years in office. Promises went down the tube. Who was the director of central intelligence? Some guy by the name of George Herbert Walker Bush. Now we're beginning to put pieces together here. The, the puzzle is beginning to form here. Who's sitting on top of this damn cover up? Oh my, now I, I want to share something with you here. I, uh, the guys in Spain ask me continually, when is it going to be disclosure? Good God, you guys, when is, you know, it's been years and years and years now. We expect the United States government to disclose this. When are you going to do it? And I said, guys, hold your breath. It ain't going to happen anytime soon because it's too big a story. And then, of course, Greer and Bassett were there at the conference. And, uh, well, let me give you a small parable here. I've got a little parable I've prepared. It's called The Three Stevens and the Apocalypse. <laughs> That sounds religious enough, doesn't it? Yeah. The Three Stephens and the Apocalypse. And I want to now touch upon that word, Apocalypse, because I, that's another word that ticks me off. I am so pissed off at the number of people who misuse that word. Most of my fundamentalist friends, and I have a few still, yet yeah, after all these years, uh, keep talking about the four horsemen of the Apocalypse. Oh my God, we're doomed, you know. War, famine, plague, pestilence, the four horsemen are riding. For God's sake, the four horsemen have been riding for 10,000 damn years. <laughs> but most of them never really grasp the meaning of the word apocalypse. It's a Greek word. And it has several meanings. The revealing, 
The uncovering and the disclosing of what? The truth. And you're living in the middle of the apocalypse. You've been living in it for the last 10 to 20 years and you're going to be living in it for another 20 or 30 years. The revealing, the uncovering, and the disclosing is taking place. As you sit here and as you breathe, it is taking place now. But I got into this little tangle with Greer and Bassett. I respect them both. They're, they're decent guys. I've known Stephen Greer for years. They keep hammering away. They have these conferences in Washington and they keep prodding the Congress and they keep prodding the government. And You've got to have a committee, you've got to reveal this material, you've got to tell the American people the truth, blah, blah, blah. And the government, pardon me, but they give them that middle finger, you know, in the air. <laughs> Excuse me, ladies, I'm sorry, that's rather rude, but the government does that to Greer and Bassett. And they go back and they say, well, maybe next week, maybe you know, next month. Oh, a new administration. Ooh, we've got Podesta, who worked for... Clinton, we've got Panetta, Panetta, who worked for Clinton, <clears throat> and we got a young president who I believe is honest and transparent and is going to tell us the truth. <clears throat> I said to Bassett and Greer, don't hold your breath, guys. It ain't going to happen. That new president ain't going to put that on his plate, not if he can avoid it because he's not going to get the whole story right now. He's got so damn much piled up outside of his Oval Office, he can hardly get in and out of it. And you all know the, the story on that. <clears throat> now, who's the other Stephen? Ah, young man in Hollywood. Spielberg. Now, where does he fit into this thing? Well, when I was asked about disclosure, is it going to happen? And I say, no, yes, yes, no, no, yes. And everybody's saying, what the hell is he talking about? Disclosure has been underway for some time. Steven Spielberg made a bunch of movies. He made E.T., which I think most of you have probably seen. He, that was for the kids. He made another one called The Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and that was for the big guys. And then he made a television series called Taken, which was dynamite. And the t tell me, and I've got this from sources that I trust, that he's got two, two separate programs in the mill, another movie and perhaps another TV series that he's working on, that they're going to come up with hopefully in the next few years. Now these movies, as they come out, affect people. There's not a one of you here in the audience that wasn't, you know, affected by E.T. It was cute. It was a kid's story, really. And I think there's not a one of you who hadn't, wasn't touched at the closing scene of Close Encounters of the Third Kind when the guys piled aboard that ship and off it went. And then Taken which I think ran for a number of weeks. I can't remember how many episodes it was. 20. 20? Good God, yes. Well, that's a major program. It was powerful, well-written, and dynamite. And it had so much classified material in it that most people, I don't think, ever realized that they were looking at classified material. And then there was another guy out in Hollywood who I got to know. A number of years ago, I was honored to be invited to be a speaker at the Mensa Regional Conference in uh, Orange County. And I was honored to be invited, and I went and spoke to the Mensa crowd. And the guest of honor at that particular regional conference was a dude by the name of Chris Carter. He was the producer director of The, the X-Files, as most of you know. After presentations and all, and drinks, you know, I got, got him aside, and we're, we're standing there sipping away. Fruit juice, of course. Uh, pulled him over, and I says, Chris, you've got to level with me. 
I says, I've been watching your program here now for some time. I think it had been underway for about six years at that time. And I said, it's impressive. Some of your stories are dynamite. Some of your stories aren't worth bothering to blow them away. But it's a pretty decent series. But I says, I want to ask you something. There are three incidents, three episodes of your X-Files that I happen to know are highly classified government secrets. And I've been on the inside. I, I, I knew these things to be classified. And here they are, I, I'm seeing on the X-Files, for God's sake. And I says, how the hell do you guys do that? He says, I've got some great writers. And I said, bullshit, nonsense, <laughs> poppycock, you know. What is it, my the old British ancestors, balderdash. <clears throat> I said, you can't tell me that your writers have come up with classified material that they've dramatized that are right on and are still classified. And he looked around and he got a sheepish grin on his face and he says, well, yeah, we've been getting some story ideas from a variety of sources. <clears throat> I said, where? And he said, well, I, you know, I can't really say, but we've been getting some promotional ideas from different people. And I said, well, you're right on. I, the three and I laid them out for him. These three particular cases were classified and still are classified. And all he did, he looked at me sheepishly and he grinned and he says, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Stay tuned. And it ran for another two years. <clears throat> But there again is what I wanted to point out to you, what is what Spielberg was involved in, what Chris Carter is involved in, and what some of the directors and writers of the Stargate series and the Star Trek series, in from time to time, little bits and pieces of material are injected into those storylines that are not fiction. They're not science fiction. They're science fact. But they're in introduced in such a way that you don't know it. You don't recognize it. It hits you at what's known as the subliminal level. <clears throat> and when I tell you that disclosure ain't going to happen, and then I tell you that disclosure is happening now, I'm referring to that subliminal educational program that is underway that you're all being subjected to. You're getting the uncovering and the revealing and the disclosure in subtle ways that you don't even recognize. And you're going to get more of it because the program apparently is rather successful and the, the guys who put it together are rather pleased at your response. And you're going to be getting more stories. And you're going to get some stories that are so far out you're going to say to yourself, good God, that, that couldn't happen. But good God, it is happening. Ben Rich, before he retired from Lockheed Martin, made some comments to a number of people there. California. We're in California. Forgive me. I'm from Arizona. I, I, I baked my gourd in Phoenix for the last six to eight months, and I, I lose it sometimes. This program is underway. It's subtle, it's continuous, and it is subliminal education. And it's affecting you. It's affecting everybody. And you're going to see more of it. They did it in the Stargate series. They did it in Star Trek, Kirk. Jean-Luc Picard and the rest of them, from the Enterprise. They slip little bits and pieces in from time to time where you think, ooh, isn't that exciting? Isn't that way out? Guys, it's not that way out. Ben Rich said before he retired, he says, we're a hundred years ahead of establishment science. And this is a guy who had a, had a right to know and he had a need to know and he was in the inside of the program. We're a hundred years ahead of establishment science. The stuff that normally is understood by guys in universities, you know, on the street. Rich says we're a hundred years beyond that. 
And he said, he says, you know, we could take E.T. home. Now, the movie was out at the, about that time. And you know the story from E.T., a little dude says, E.T., go home. E.T. wants to go home. Rich says, we can take E.T. home. Now, this, Ben Rich has been dead for 10 years, for God's sake. I, I knew another Lockheed Martin scientist who has passed away. A guy by the name of David Froning, who worked with Lockheed Martin for, oh, almost 30 years. I invited David to speak at a conference in, in Phoenix some years back. Wendell Stevens and I put on a program and we, we, we got a hold of Froning. We knew he was brilliant and uh, we knew he had been on the inside of research at Lockheed Martin for so long. And uh, we got David to come down and speak at our conference there in Phoenix. And he was getting up in years. David's gone home now. He was getting up in years. And he shared some things with us. Excuse me here. I didn't want to put my posterior here to the audience, but I <laughs> don't know how else to do this. I got to. Oh. God, they got me so wired up here. Anyhow, Froning said, you know, Bob, he said, uh, I've been retired now for oh, 10 years. He says, before I retired, I was in the Advanced Systems Division of Lockheed Martin. And we were dealing with something we called modified field propulsion. A variable field, he said. Of course, he began to lose me immediately. I didn't regret his talk, what he was talking about. Matter-antimatter conversion. Exotic field tension. Wormhole. He said it will modify time and space. And he says we have had transluminal flight for over 30 years. And I had to stop again and I says, hold it. Transluminal, hyperluminal flight. I says, you're talking about faster than light for cost sake. He said, yeah, we've had it now for 30 years. Now this is from David Froning who'd spent, you know, biggest chunk of his life as an advanced systems engineer for Lockheed Martin. And then we get the material from uh, Ben Rich. And somebody said to Rich, he said, Ben, what the hell are you really talking about? He goes to the blackboard. His big dinner for retirement, I think, was one of the major hangers over there. Blackboard, he goes up and he writes, uh, unfunded opportunities. They say, what the hell are you talking about? He takes a chalk and he circles U, F, and O. Oh. And then he left the stage and walked out the door and they're all thinking, good God, what this man's lost to here. Unfunded opportunities, UFO. What he was inferring and saying literally in their face, yes, we have reverse engineered technology from alien craft. And we're flying it and it works. And we can take E.T. home. Now, one of the reasons I get so ticked off, you have to forgive me here, I'm getting old. I don't have the patience I used to have. The rumor has been going around that I've turned out to be a, you know, a mean, rotten old fart. <laughs> Cynical, you know, grumpy. Well, that's not entirely true. I like to think, as Henry Higgins said, that I have the milk of human kindness by the quart in every vein. But I can't really pull it off. I guess I am getting kind of grumpy in my old age. Guys, I'm getting angry. I really am getting angrier every day when I think about the con job that's being pulled on you and 300 million other Americans on a daily basis where they are literally conning you to the point they're taking you to the cleaners they're stealing you blind, and then they're lying to you about it. And I, I have a list of 
I call it my pissed off list. <clears throat> you know, when you're old and you're sitting in retirement, you have to f spend your time doing something. So I, I prepare this list. Top of the list are politicians. And I say repeatedly that you guys have the best Congress money can buy. That bunch of clowns in Washington who consider, who think of themselves, call themselves Congress, they, we should build special prisons for them. I'm serious. I think about half of them should be put up in front of a judge and, and sent off for 10 years because they're a bunch of damn thieves. Not only are they molesting children, and then what the hell, the governor of North Carolina, South Carolina, big scandal, he, his love affair is in Argentina. To hell with his wife and kids, his love affair is in Argentina. And then we've got congressmen who are guilty of the same thing. Some of them are gay, and I'm not putting them down because they're gay, I'm putting them down because they lie about it. Well, as I say, guys, we've got a, a mess of clowns back there. What is it, as Will Rogers said, the most permanent, ongoing, continuing, self-continuing program in the world of liars and cheats is the United States Congress. And Will's been gone for a long, long time. So I get my dander up, and I, I vent my spleen when I come and talk to guys like you. and. Uh, I will say this to you, at the next election for Congress and the next one for the President, think carefully about what clowns you want to send off to Washington. I mean examine them carefully because they're supposed to represent you and they're not doing a very good job of it. Okay, excuse me, I, I do have a tendency to r ramble a bit because I got so damn much to cover. <sighs> oh, yes. At one of the top of my lists is NASA. You know that crowd? Never a straight answer? <laughs> NASA. This Newsweek came out a couple of weeks back. I'm sure most of you may have seen it. This is a shameful issue. This is a shameful article. In search of aliens, it says. And then it says, NASA is out there looking. <laughs> now, while I was in Spain, the Spaniards asked me, you know, just as I was going over there, we were celebrating 40 years of Apollo 11. Gee, that was something, wasn't it? We put a couple of guys on the moon. We're patting ourselves on the back and we're tooting our little horns. Wasn't that great? Wasn't that cool? Didn't we? Weren't we special? And I had to say to some of my Spanish friends over there, you can never trust this damn bunch over at NASA. They did go to the moon, but that was only half the story. The story was what they found when they got there. And the story was what the photographs had taken. Now, you probably know this, but in case you don't, I'll tell you again. NASA admitted about two years ago, I think about two years back, that they had inadvertently, inadvertently erased 40 rolls of film from the Apollo program. And that, that release went out over the media and Congress didn't say a word, no peep, no poop, nothing. Uh, the media itself, they reported it and off into the wind. NASA says we inadvertently, mistakenly, gee, we're sorry, we erased 40 rolls of film from the Apollo program. Now, we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands, of individual photographs in those 40 rolls. They erased them. Why? 
because they showed what they ran into on the moon. They showed what they ran into on the way to the moon. They showed what they ran into when they got there. This has got to go. We can't let that out. But some nitwit in NASA had forgotten that NASA had given a contract to the Japanese Space Agency back in the 60s, probably involving big bucks, where the Japanese, a sharp bunch of guys over there, bought every negative or every shot of every picture taken by the entire Apollo program and they've got it in their computers in Japan. And NASA evidently forgot that. <laughs> now listen, you have to understand something. There are damn guy, fine guys in NASA. There are good scientists. There's some fine people working there. Uh, I'm not putting them down. I, I, take my hat off to them and I respect them. The ones that I am really pissed off at are the administrators, the policy makers, the politicians. They forgot that they had sold all this to Japan. Lo and behold, I'm at a, spe I'm at a conference in Tokyo. I was a, a guest of Junichi Yaoi, one of the foremost Japanese researchers and UFO experts. I was on national television in Japan. While I was there, I was provided some photographs taken by NASA and the Apollo program that the Japanese Space Agency has been sitting on top of for a long, long time. And I'm about to show you a couple right now. Okay, this is negative nine. This is Apollo Systems A13. Yeah, Apollo Systems 13. Now, bear with me till I get this thing up here. Okay. This photograph was taken by Apollo 13. Now, you may remember Apollo 13. It was the one that never made it to the moon. They had a tiny explosion on the way where an oxygen tank blew up and that they were barely able to get to the moon, go around and barely able to get home. But they were not alone on that trip. And so while they were out in the way going and coming, they were a little, little windows and they snapped pictures. This is one picture that was held by the Japanese Space Agency. You can see the Japanese writing here. Anyhow, I didn't bring my pointer. This is the moon, upper left. These two objects here, B and C, are fairly large, circular disks of some kind. But over here, A, which is moving into the, the scene, here is the positive and here is the negative. I hope you can all see that. The guys in, in, the, in the Apollo 13 capsule Thank you, honey. Thank you very much. I got you guys are something else. <laughs> oh, here we are. Okay, this is a circular disk with a dome. Here's the moon. Another disk. But this dude is coming into the picture. And here we are. Here's the, here's the photo and here's the negative down here. This object is five miles long. <clears throat> so you wonder why my, my, my NASA is keeping its mouth shut. How, how can they talk about something like that? How can they release something like that to you? An, uh, an object we encountered on the way to the moon that's five miles long. Now, just give some thought. Try to consider a technology, a culture, a civilization that can not only build something like that, put it in space, put it in orbit around the Earth, but staff it and man it with how many? 
I had the pleasure of being on a couple of aircraft carriers. My son is a career naval officer. Spent 14 years on aircraft carriers. Nimitz class, atomic powered carriers. For those of you who don't know, they are impressive. They're a thousand feet long. They have crew, a crew complement of 5,000 men. These big nuclear Nimitz class carriers have 5,000 guys in their crew. They're massive, they're gigantic, they're unbelievable. Now, we were joking one day about it, Eric and I, my son. What kind of a crew would this dude have with, you know, five miles? Uh, what are they doing over there? What are they, you know, what is their pastime? What is their function? What is their purpose? And uh, having been on a Nimitz carrier a couple of times, you know, they're very impressive. Soda fountains, you know, snack bars and all the rest of it to make the guys comfortable, you know. Uh, I anticipated, I've assumed that on board of an object out there, five miles long, you have bowling alleys, restaurants, theaters, uh, you know, all kinds of entertainment. Because we've learned over the years that if you're an alien and you are involved in human beings, you need entertainment. <laughs> <coughs> so they probably have saunas aboard, you know, and, and probably the, the most favorite pastime, I would think, is watching human television. Think for a moment, having watched it yourself, and all of the idiotic crap that goes on on TV. And imagine what a bunch of guys from another star system are thinking. They're rolling in the aisles probably laughing about these, these unbelievable monkeys down there. And they're watching our, our stories, dancing with the stars. <laughs> and they are supposed to think of us as being intelligent and advanced and sophisticated. Oh my. Okay, this is the first shot. Here is the second one. This is negative 10. Okay, now that big dude has moved over into the middle of the frame. And another object has showed up over here, was estimated at being two miles long. But this one, five miles. Here is the print print and here is the negative. It's the same object but it seems to have had moved somewhat. We're not getting a full side view like we did in the other picture. We're getting a little elongated and there are a couple of circular disc-like objects here. Apparently it's, it, it's like a carrier. It, 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 it puts its aircraft out and brings them back and it's probably a, a carrier for discs alien disks that we find in our skies all the time. But again, the, the, when you start considering the, the magnitude of the size and the implications of what it means, then you can almost sympathize with the, the authorities about, we can't tell those people these things. No, 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 they're not ready for it. No, 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 hell, they, they weren't ready for it. They're the ones that were scared to death. You guys can probably handle it. But they can't. <clears throat> ah, that was only the beginning of the story. Over the years, I've been fortunate in that I have been lucky in finding smart people in the most unlikely places. I'm speaking at a conference at the Bay Area a number of years ago. And a little dude shows up by the name of Norman Bergeron. Norman retired from NASA after almost 30 years. He was an engineer and a photographic expert. And he was responsible, he and a number of others were responsible in putting together what they called the Voyager program. Because in the late 70s, astronomers and guys in NASA had discovered some anomalous things happening in the rings of Saturn. I love that word anomalous. It, things were happening, they didn't know what the hell they were. They didn't know how to explain it. 
So what they did, they put together a multi-million dollar program called Voyager. And they sent Voyager to the rings of Saturn in 1980. And when Voyager 1 got in the rings of Saturn, it began taking pictures and the pictures were sent back to NASA and they were astounded, literally astounded. They got stuff they didn't expect. Now before I go into detail about these photos, I will tell you that Norman Bergeron, little dude about five feet tall, you know, pink cheeks, little bow tie, brilliant as hell. Last year when I saw him at the Bay Area, he was 87. I have been unable to reach him. I've tried through the phones, and my wife tried with the computer. And can't reach Norman. I don't know whether he's passed over, gone home, or what happened. All I know is that last year in the Bay Area, I introduced him and they, they mobbed him. And the little dude had a box of books. And after I introduced him, he got mobbed and they sold every, he sold every book he had at 50 bucks a pop. But Norman was what I say, there, there are some good folks in NASA honest men who would like to tell you everything they've learned and everything they know. So anyhow, Norman, after frustration and time passed, he, uh, 1986, Norman decided to blow the whistle and publish the photographs that Voyager 1 took in the rings of Saturn. He couldn't get his book published in the United States. Wonder why? U.S. publishers wouldn't touch him, wouldn't even talk to him. The little dude had to go to Scotland, Aberdeen, Scotland, to get his book published. And that's the cover of his book. And it may be available, you maybe can find a copy if you try, here, there, or wherever. I hate, hate to tell you what they might cost now, because they are collector's items. <clears throat> but I was delighted that I was able to discover him and present him to the conference in the Bay Area last year. <clears throat> the response from the audience was overwhelming. His little face lit up and gave me a big hug, tears in his eyes. But he published his book in Aberdeen, Scotland, and it is a dynamite book. Now on the cover, this you see here on the right is part of the B ring of Saturn. You know there are A, B, C, a whole bunch of rings. Gigantic. Saturn's a giant planet. And these rings are incredible. This thing here, self-luminous, obviously artificial construction, obviously under intelligent control, because it moves around in the rings of Saturn. And uh, they don't know what the hell it is, but it's larger than our moon. An intelligent, constructed, artificial object larger than our moon, moving around throughout the rings of Saturn, wherever it will go, and we get a picture of it and we don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to respond. Bigger than our moon. Ah, that's only part of the story. Ah, oh, here we go. This is in the A-ring, and uh, the statistics on this will blow your mind. This object here is an artificially constructed, as Norman says, we, the NASA called it an electromagnetic vehicle. <clears throat> that dude is 2,000 miles long. over 450 miles in diameter, but 2,000 miles long. And here is another self-luminous artificial object about the size of our moon that appar apparently moves here, there, and everywhere, wherever it'll go, obviously under intelligent control. But consider this thing. Consider the civilization, the technology, the culture that can not only build something like that, but put it in space, move it here and there wherever they will. 
for whatever purpose. Norman says he thought they were making the rings, which is why he titled his book <clears throat> The Ringmakers. I said, Norman, do you ever stop to think they might be mining the rings? We've concluded from several missions, the Vo that Voyager 1 was only the first of, of a whole bunch of them, that the rings are made up of minerals from perhaps God knows how many eons back when the planets were being formed. And I said, stop to think about an advanced technology. They could mine those rings. And those minerals are gold mined, you know. Talk about nutrients. You've got all that good stuff. And he says, you know, I didn't think about that. That They might be mining them. <clears throat> God, I wish I knew what happened to Norman. I just lost track of him. But his book is, is a monument to the fact that there are some decent men in NASA who want the truth told. Now I want to ask, show of hands, how many of you are overwhelmed and shocked at these facts about those objects out there? Oh, a few. Overwhelmed and shocked. Well, that's good. That's good. Well, I, I was overwhelmed and shocked the first time I saw it. And the first time I began to put it together and considered what it meant, because there is, there is what we're getting to, to the imp, important thing here. What does this mean? Now, I assume most of you are aware and familiar with a brilliant educator, physicist in New York by the name of Miki, Michio Kaku. Brilliant young man, a quantum physicist, theoretical physicist. Michio has come up with what he considers to be a possibility of four different kinds of advanced civilizations. Type 1, 2, 3, and 4. You, by the way, are members of a 0, zero type civilization. <laughs> Not that you didn't know that, but you haven't quite reached type 1 yet. <clears throat> and the conclusion many of us have reached is that we're looking at the results of at least a type 2 civilization. Now, how do these guys out there look upon us? Really do. How, how, how do you think they think of us? I have a pretty good idea because I've been getting some legitimate information with <clears throat> from American military and scientific people who have not only met some of them from out there but are working alongside of them in United States government national laboratories like Sandia, uh, Los Alamos, um, Brookhaven National Laboratory in Long Island which is one of the most, most super secret laboratories. Anyhow, we have scientists and military guys that have been working alongside of some of those dudes, and they are in our midst. When I retired, we knew of four different groups, and they were all humanoid. But they were all not the kind of guys who could walk up and down the street on a Saturday afternoon without being seen or responded to. But one of the groups of four looks exactly like us in the sense that it could be sitting here in this auditorium next to you and you wouldn't know it. Next to you in an airplane or a restaurant or a theater. They're in our midst, guys. This one group particularly is in our midst. And apparently since 1954, when Ike met them at Morak Air Force Base in California, They've been working with us, trying to help us make that transition from adolescence into adulthood. And why are they doing that? Well, apparently this is the same group that had a hand in engineering our genetics 10,000, 10, 100,000 years ago. And if you want a little history on that subject, uh, read Zechariah Sitchin which I suspect most of you are familiar with. His stories are shockingly accurate in the fact they literally tell the essential story of our beginnings. 
They translate these ancient cuneiform tablets from Sumer. Zechariah is not the only one. There was a brilliant Englishman by the name of Christian O'Brien who went home a year or so ago. <clears throat> Christian O'Brien wrote a, wrote a beautiful, unbelievable, powerful book called The Genius of the Few. If you can ever find that somewhere, get a copy. Christian O'Brien said essentially the same thing Zechariah has said. We were genetically engineered and they've been coming and going and they've been in our midst for a hell of a long time. And somebody said to Sitchin one time, Zechariah, when are they coming back? And he said, whatever made you think they ever left? And I don't think they did ever leave. <clears throat> now, again, this is, I think, a little shocking information here. At least it shocked the hell out of me. Now, when I was in Germany at a conference some years ago, a Russian cosmonaut by the name of Marina Popovich handed out a few copies to me and Michael Hesseman, another researcher, friend of mine, that the Phobos, Soviet Phobos mission took on Mars when it was out there oh, 15, 20 years ago. The Soviets thought that sent this fantastic mission to Mars. They, they named it Phobos II because Phobos I is one of the moons of Mars, 12 miles in diameter. So they named their, their space mission Phobos II and they took a whole bunch of pictures. One of the pictures they took, which Michael Hessman published in his magazine, is apparently a city the size of Chicago under the surface in Mars generating an enormous amount of heat because this photo was taken in the infrared. It's in German at the bottom here but Michael had published it in his magazine from Phobos II. A city under the surface of Mars the size of Chicago. You can see all practically you know the blocks, the streets, so on. So yes, Virginia, there are Martians, and yes, they are on Mars, and some of them are probably here, because we apparently don't look that different from each other. But you'll never see this published in an American newspaper or an American magazine. It had to be published in Germany by Michael Hesseman. Phobos took another picture. While it was in orbit around Mars, and the story I was told is that they literally planned to land on Phobos, the moon. Well, they never got there. Because while they're in orbit around Mars, this thing came up from the surface of Mars, gigantic in size, and apparently bumped Phobos too, and knocked it out of orbit, and down it went. So there's somebody up there who says, no, 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 no. You can come and peek, but then you can't stay very long, and you're not going to take that many pictures. We're not going to allow it. Ah. Okay. I think that does my photographs for you this afternoon. I don't know where the hell the turn off button on this thing is. Maybe Bill can find it. Anyhow, I'll leave it. Now, as I said to you, I, I, I'm ticked off. I have this pissed off roster, which is work of, a work of joy and pleasure for me. <laughs> as I said, politicians at the top, particularly the United States Congress, uh, they're a bunch of clowns. They literally run a circus back there. Theologians are right next, below. Forgive me, I'm not anti-religious. I simply don't like religion because it tends to divide people. It separates people. My God is better than your God. My book is better than your book. My story is truer than your story, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
So I'm not religious at all. I, I've studied them all. I've studied Hinduism. I've studied Islam. I've studied Judaism. I was raised a Christian. I've studied Christianity. I consider the young man from Galilee my best friend. But that's another story that I don't think we have time for me to get into. I went through a series of hypnotic past life regressions a number of years ago. And one of the lives that I discovered was in Galilee 2,000 years ago with him. So I say he was my best friend and he still is my best friend. Anyhow, I am not anti-religious. I respect the people who are sincere and honest about it. But it does tend to separate people. It divides people. And I try to promote the concept of a spiritual approach to life. If you human beings had the slightest idea of what you are, my God, you're incredible. You are all of you masterpieces. You, you really need to know what Yogananda said. You need to reach a state of self-realization when you recognize that within you burns a spark of pure divinity. And it don't matter what church you go to or what language you speak or what politics you are or what color your skin might be. That don't matter. You are divinity in itself. You are part of that infinite spark which my friend from Galilee said the kingdom of heaven is within you and the, the gang back there didn't really grasp what he was talking about but his, his truths and his words are as legitimate today as they ever were and you guys are getting there you're beginning to pay attention you're beginning to wake up now, as I said, my pissed off list goes down, you know. We had NASA, the politicians, the theologians, and then it, there's the American mass of people, the public. What is it they used to kill? The great unwashed? You know, Joe Sixpack? Listen, I, I have to be, be kind with Joe because at the moment, bless his heart, he may have lost his job. He may be losing his home. He can't pay his bills. He's got kids to send through school and educate and buy clothes for. So I, I, I'm trying to be gentle with Joe Sixpack because he's, he's carrying a heavy load right now. I mean, there are tens of thousands of them out there all over the country. There may be some of them in the audience here tonight. And you probably know a few of them. And they're damn fine people. So I'm not trying to fault them too much, the fact that they're not paying attention. I, I, I get a little ticked off of, oh, NASCAR, basketball, football, tennis, golf. My God, these fixations with these little balls, you know? <laughs> Freud would have a ball with that, you know? No pun intended. Old Sigmund would have a real fine time working that out. Okay. Forgive me for wandering. It's important that I get some of this stuff. I, one of the things that I, I fault the average guy out there is for his attention span. He seems to be suffering, the masses of them seem to be suffering what they call attention deficit disorder. Now, it's a problem that the kids in school have. They, they can't seem to focus on anything more than two or three minutes, and then they're off somewhere else, off to somewhere else. And I blame television for that, as well as their parents for allowing them to do that. How many of them sit down and read a book these days? Anyhow, their attention span is very, very limited. And the, the public at large has a limited attention span. For example, let me get back here, go back a few years. Ah, Werner von Braun said in 1959, now get the year, 59, 
Five years after 54. Now what the hell happened in 54? Well, something unusual happened at Morock Air Force Base in California in 54, where an aging president had an encounter that literally damn near killed him. Because right after this event in 54 at Morock, the poor old dude had a heart attack. He was not able to deal with this thing. Anyhow, in 1959, a famous Nazi by the name of Werner von Braun, who literally built our Saturn V program from the ground up, had this to say, and this appeared in several U.S. newspapers. I kid you not, this was published in newspapers. Werner said in 59, we find ourselves faced by powers which are far stronger than we had hitherto assumed and whose base is at present unknown to us. I cannot say more at present. We are now engaged in entering into closer contact with those powers. Now, wouldn't you have thought that Werner would have been mobbed? Explain this? What the hell are you talking about? Who are these powers that you're referring to? I mean, you're one of our top scientists. You're building the Apollo program for us. This is in 59. <clears throat> No major response, like it just went over. Ah, 1980, another German professor by the name of Hermann Oberth said this, and this was quoted and published in several American newspapers. We cannot take the credit for our record advancement in certain scientific fields alone. We have been helped by the peoples of other worlds. Now, did this cause a ripple? Did people say, what the hell are you talking about, professor? People of other worlds, what? Yeah, yeah. It cries out for answers, and there weren't any, and nobody made a deal out of it. And then here we have something in 1987. A prominent American senator from Hawaii. Daniel K. Inui, <clears throat> United States Senator from Hawaii. He said this in, in a committee and it's in the congressional record. There exists a shadowy government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, and its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest free from all checks and balances and free from the law itself. And this is in the congressional record. And did that cause a response? Did people mob the senator and say, Senator, what the hell are you talking about? This is dynamite. Uh, attention deficit disorder. Alan Hynek said before he died, a series of events occurred in New York along the Hudson River some years ago, called the Hudson River events, where gigantic triangular and boomerang shaped objects a mile and a mile and a half along across hovered over the Hudson River, moved slowly up and down the Taconic Freeway there, Hundreds of people going up and down, guys pulling off the road, looking up and seeing this damn thing. It was gigantic. It hovered over the Indian Point nuclear reactor for an hour. All the alarms went off. All of the security people responded to this thing. And it, it took place. And not one word from the authorities about this except some stupid ass idea of a bunch of guys were flying little planes around at night in formation. The FAA, to its eternal shame, said things like that. Oh, these guys were flying around in their little airplanes, you know, in formation at night. Never mentioning that this was a total violation of FAA regulations, as if those little guys in little airplanes couldn't match something that's a mile and a half across, a boomerang, a triangle. 
attention deficit disorder. It goes on and on and on. Where am I here? As I say, I tend to wander, forgive me. Okay, I've given you your little uh, parable. I talked about David Froning. I talked about Ben Rich. I quoted Inoue, Von Braun, Oberth, the shadow government. Oh, I want to touch upon one little other thing here. There's an, amu an amusing situation that has taken place. I find it amusing and I find it tragic. There's a young Brit by the name of Gary McKinnon. Many of you I'm familiar with this story. <clears throat> Gary, it seems, is a computer nerd. He's a real genius. He's a hacker. Well, Gary happened to be able to hack into the Defense Department computers here about a year ago, a little over a year now. <clears throat> he hacked into NASA's computers a little over a year ago. <clears throat> and he come up with some stuff that was dynamite. And so what happened is that we found out about it and we got a hold of the Brits and we said, we want that man and we're going to put him on trial and we're going to stick his ass in jail for 70 years. And so help me God, the British agreed to extradite young Gary McKinnon to the United States for trial and sentencing. Now I stand curious to see what kind of a trial they plan to put on for McKinnon. It's got to be a public trial. He's not a U.S. citizen. They're charging him with a violation of our computer security systems and all the rest of it. So this kid's being sent from the U.K. over to the United States and they're going to put his little butt up in front of a judge and a jury and charge him with damage by breaking into our NASA and our Defense Department computers. I and others have said they should hire the kid for Christ's sake and put him to work. If he can, if he can crack, you know, hack into those computers, he must be know what the hell he's doing. Ah, but let me just touch lightly upon what did Gary McKinnon come up with? Ah, what did he download when he hacked into those computers? He apparently downloaded some stuff, packaged up the material, and turned it over to a British researcher by the name of Timothy Good. Now, Tim, for many of you who know of him or know of him, he's probably one of the top researchers on the planet. He's a brilliant young man. Well, I say young, he's about the age of my son, about 57, maybe close to 60. I'm sorry? Anyhow, Timothy Good apparently was the recipient of some of this downloaded material from McKinnon. McKinnon says, I got some dynamite here. And he gave it to Timothy Good with the idea that maybe Timothy eventually could publish it. Now the question is, is are they going to try to extradite Timothy Good to the United States and put his butt in front of a jury, or jury and a judge? But we don't know. The, the Brits I met in, in Barcelona told me that the story is pretty definite, pretty true. Ah, but the, what does McKinnon download? Ah, let me just touch upon a couple of things. Orders, military orders, transferring a commander from one vessel to another vessel. Now the vessels were named USSS Curtis LeMay. And the other vessel that this guy transferred to, this commander, was the USSS Roscoe Hillencotter. Now, Curtis LeMay, most of you are well aware, is dead now, one of our top four-star Air Force generals who bombed Japan back to the Stone Age, practically, because strategic air command. There is a vessel named the USSS Curtis LeMay, and a commander transferred from that to the USSS Roscoe Hillencotter. Now, Roscoe Hillencotter is dead now, but he was a four-star Navy admiral who was the first director of Central Intelligence. Now, the guys, the researchers, have gone to the records and there ain't no listing of vessels with those names in the entire U.S. Navy manifest. 
So the question arises, my God, where is LeMay, the, the, the Curtis LeMay? Where is the hill in Carter? And the inference we're getting is that apparently they're in orbit somewhere out there. And now we're talking about one of the biggest secrets of all time, where your missing trillions have probably been going. There is a separate space program which you guys are paying for. And they're not telling you anything about it. And as a result, NASA is a bit of a joke. We have a special space program, and it is apparently known as the United States Aerospace Command. And it is a joint service agency. That means it includes Navy, Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, and it also includes the British. Aerospace Command. They launch satellites from several different positions on the planet. They maintain, apparently, an entire fleet of vessels in orbit. And they have anti-gravity and zero-point energy, which you guys have a right to and you ain't going to see for another 10 years. Now that's where your missing trillions are gone. You know the story. 98, 99, and 2000, 1.7 a year for three years disappeared off the books. That bunch of clowns in Congress, you think there was an uproar? You think there was a demand for answers? Where did that money go? Forget it. Now, the day before 9-11, the Secretary of Defense says, we're missing $3 trillion. We can't account for it. It's off the books somehow. We're, we're, we're working on it. Maybe an accounting error. You know how they are, the double speak. George Orwell would be happy with this crowd. Missing three trillion after the already missing of 1.7 a year for three years. There's where the funding is coming from your aerospace command that Daniel Inui is talking about a separate shadow government that you have no idea exists. And those guys have got the technology that Ben Rich says is a hundred years beyond establishment knowledge. And really, if you talk about being pissed off, that kind of information drives me up the wall. And I say to you guys, and I hope you're as pissed off about it as I am, We've damn well got to get some answers from these idiots back there, or our country is gone forever. And I don't want to see that happen. When I went into the military, I signed an oath to die for that Constitution if I had to. And I believe in that Constitution. It was a work of genius, the best form of government's ever been devised. And they're trashing it. And we're not, we're not standing up and defending it enough. We're not insisting that they account for being in office, and drawing those big salaries. OK, guys, I've covered a whole lot of stuff here. As I said, I, I tend to wonder. I guess it's the name of the game. Coming to the end of my presentation here. As I said, I've been speaking out rather bluntly and loudly for a number of years on this subject. As I said, it's the biggest story in human history because it is the story of human history. It's your story. It's who you are, how you got to be here, and where you're going. And I've told you that I, I'm outraged at the doomsayers. Oh, God, 2012, we're doomed, it's all over. <gasps> there are asteroids, whatever. A pole shift, we're all doomed. That, that Mayan shaman in Germany years ago told me, he said, you white skins, you do it every time. You screw it all up. He says, that's not what the hell the story is. 
He says, I'm an expert on my calendar. I'm an expert on the history of my people. And that's not the end of the damn world. It's the beginning of a new age. He says, we look forward to it with anticipation and excitement. The old world is coming to a close and a new way of thinking is coming. And it's going to be so unlike anything that's ever existed before. He says, we are so excited about the future. 2012, that day will come and go. It'll be the end of our long count, but so what? What's important is there a new age coming? And you guys are all a part of it. And I say in closing that there are going to be some difficult times ahead because we are literally in this transformation, this transition that is a transformative transformation, not only of the planet, but of the human species. And it's primarily spiritual in its nature. And that is a very hopeful thing to discuss and understand and accept. As I said, we're, we're phasing out of a, a, pay, a, phase, a phase of adolescence. We, we are going through adolescence and we're going to reach adulthood. And if you all remember, I'm sure you do, adolescence was not a hell of a lot of fun. I found it painful as hell when I was going through it, and so did my mother and father while I was going through it. <clears throat> but we're making that transition. <clears throat> And it's hopeful and favorable, and I want to leave you with a remark or two that I think is important. I'm a great fan of Leo Tolstoy, one of my favorite authors. <clears throat> he was a mystic, tremendous great writer, philosopher. And Count Leo Tolstoy said, and I quote, there is something in the human spirit that will survive and will prevail. There is a tiny and brilliant light burning in the heart of man that will not go out no matter how dark the world becomes. And I want to leave you tonight with that comment about that spark of divinity that burns brightly within each and every one of you. God bless you, and good night.